Good morning, it's The Music Reel and my name is Nicola Burton. and I'm your host for today. My very special guest is a man called Richard Flowell. Now, Richard is currently in Toronto in Canada, but he originally hails from the UK, I think Yorkshire. And Richard, my goodness, your cheat sheet is incredible. You're a music producer, promoter, publicist, PR guy. You're an award-winning journalist. And we met when you brought the jerry cans out to Australia a couple of years ago. So, Richard, I just wanted to check in and see how you're doing in the lockdown over there. Well, I, I have regarded this lockdown as uh, something parallel to the various stages you go through if somebody says you're dying. <laughs> At first, you deny it completely. No, it's not happening. Then, oh God, it is happening, and isn't it awful? And geez, I'm really angry and mad. Yeah. Then, uh, well, you get sort of resigned to it. And then the final stage is you accept it. Now it's been 10 weeks, whatever. Yeah. And I don't even know what day it is today. Is it Thursday? Is it Wednesday? Well, in Australia, it's always something else anyway. But it, it, you lose track of time. Your routines are you don't eat properly, you don't sleep properly, everything gets kind of screwed up. And I know, I know. The worst thing is, how long is this going on? Well, we That's apparently, in Australia, we're supposed to be in phase two next week, apparently. So what's it like for you guys? Can you, are you able to go to pubs and clubs yet? Oh, absolutely not. No, there's been, I, I go out here, live music three, four, five times a week. I have not heard a band live since March the 11th. Oh. And there's no indication that this will change in the reasonably foreseeable future. So you've had far more cases, obviously, than we have. So... Um Tell me about that. How many cases have you guys had, especially in Toronto? I, I, th I don't know about Toronto, but um, in Canada, where about 6,000 people have died. Wow. The most interesting thing in Ontario, which is, you call them states, we call them provinces, is that the vast majority of the death of the deaths have occurred in long-term care homes or, old, or seniors' homes. And the interesting thing is that our, prime, our premier, uh, who heads the state of, uh, the province of Ontario, um, is, has been, on the face of it, quite um, um, frank and supportive and encouraging and uh, has generally done a good job of keeping people um, up to date. Unfortunately, as a very right-wing conservative, he and his previous governments were primarily responsible for shutting down inspections on old folks' homes and so on. So in a sense, he and previous conservative governments, and I don't want to get into the politics, but yeah. have been largely responsible for many of the deaths that have happened. Yeah, How long it's going to go on? I don't know. Oh, you're a little bit frozen. Oh, no, you're back. You're frozen. Up. Uh you right. Can you see me? Yeah. I can see you, but it's it's freezing quite a bit, actually. Yeah, well, it's, uh, we're a long way. We're, how many thousand miles are we away? Yeah, <laughs> we are, I have no idea, but it's six o'clock in the morning in on Friday here, so I guess however far away that is. <laughs> yeah. Oh, 
Now, now you're, okay, let's go on. Yes, yes. Well, look, um, we've, I, I guess I wanted to talk to you because you are such an aficionado on music over there, actually around the world. And, you know, I mean, like you said, you haven't seen a live show in 10 weeks. Um, so that's an enormous change in your life, lifetime. What do you think moving forward, the music industry um, worldwide is actually going to look like as a result of these changes? <sighs> I, I've given this some thought, but until this is eradicated, either by vaccine, the passage of time or whatever, um, I think people are going to be very nervous about going to live music shows. Yeah. I won't be. I'm just going. I'm an old guy. I'm 85. I don't have, you know, I, I'm, I'm just taking my, my, my risks. I wear a mask when I go out. Um, I feel sometimes as I leave my apartment building, maybe I'm on the way to rob a bank. I, I, it's weird. <laughs> but that said, I think it will take a year or two years to get back to whatever the old normal was. Meanwhile, I think what happens is that festivals will kind of go out of business and have to be re reconstructed, reconstructed, refinanced. Um, bars and clubs, many of them around here, have, have kind of folded. And the government, the federal government, has been supportive with business loans and so on. But if any business was on the edge, this event has tipped them over. Yes. And um, I, it, it'll be a new start. There will be new clubs. There will be new venues for live music. But obviously, financially, concerts can't work no. if every audience member has to be six feet away from the next guy. That's right. Uh, one, one show that we're talking about doing is the annual... Uh, Maple Blues Awards, and we do this each year in a 1,200-seat theatre. What will be the situation next January when we hope to do it? We don't know. And if, the, if that 1,200-seat hall is reduced to a 300-seat hall, then the financial picture is, doesn't work. Um, I think we're lucky in Canada because our federal government is very supportive of the arts, uh, unlike, unlike the United States where, you know, I, I think the president has yet to read a book. Never mind. Don't even go there. <laughs> Don't go there. <laughs> I, I, I just see a long, first of all, uh, when, the, when the pandemic falls away, it takes a couple of years to get back to where we were. Yes. If it keeps coming back, who knows? I mean, I've lived through some strange times. When I was a little boy, I was in a war. And people were dropping bombs nearby. And for little kids, we didn't understand what that was about anyway. But, you know, we've gone through assassinations of prominent people. We've gone through 9-11 and how that changed travel around the world. And now we're going through this and we're still in the middle of it. That's right. That's Strange right. times. It's a strange time. And I guess, Richard, you've been instrumental in the, I guess, the creation of careers for people, for musicians across the world for many decades. In this new, brave new world of, of the music landscape, of, of which there's so much uncertainty, where 
they may not necessarily be able to crack the market with a live show or being part of a festival bill. What do you think will be the difference in terms of cracking the market in a PR, PR sense by using live streaming? Do you think that there's much of a difference between a live music show and a live streaming event in the creation and the setting of the foundation of a new music artist's career? Seems to be a delay. Oh, sorry, Richard, I can't hear you. Now, nope, I've lost your audio again. <laughs> Try and get some technical help. The gremlins across between Australia and Toronto are not coping right now. <laughs> now, Richard, I, I can't hear you at all, unfortunately. Oops. Oh, can you no, hear me I can, now? I can hear you. you. You're right back. There you are. You're all good. Nope, you're can right you back right now. Yes. Yes. So. Okay. Okay, great. All right. Um, I think live streaming is absolutely important that every artist has to do it uh, just to keep, first of all, to give some point to their daily life. Um, but it is not the same as a live performance. Many of the artists I work with or have worked with are, are doing these shows and getting a hundred people or 50 people or worst comes the worst five people some of the of the american roots music artists um i'm thinking of mary gaucher or steve poltz or um are getting 500 800 views but that isn't many no and the warmth and intimacy of an in-person thing. You and I, were we in my living room or in yours, be, it, it would be much easier to communicate than, than we are doing now, however well or badly we're doing this. <laughs> but I, I, I think live music needs it needs a community of people there with it. The musicians, one of my favorite gigs in Toronto to go to is a tiny bar where if you get there early enough, you are practically sitting in the band. That's a, um, a kind of a warmth, a kind of intimacy, a kind of community that you cannot get um, this way. No. Uh, I think no. some people will, I think if this goes on much longer, people who are doing, I think audiences will get tired of live streams. Mm -hmm. They will still go to see their favorite artists if they know about it, which is the question. And as for the people who are doing the live streaming, they will get better at it. Uh, this is the first Zoom call I've ever made or oh. been involved with. And Congratulations. I'm nervous and yeah. now I, I'm, I'm a, on the programming committee of the Toronto Blues Society and our meetings are on Zoom and we've got one next Tuesday and I'm scared shitless that no, I'm not going to be seal. able to do this. <laughs> You've, you've cracked the seal, you're fine, dude. Yes, I've lost my, my Zoom virginity. <laughs> anyway, okay, where were we? So I, I, think, I think we're into weird, strange times. And music, it will be even harder for a new emerging artist to emerge. 
It reminds me, in a sense, of the old days in Canada before there was a, there was a, a, a shift in Canadian music industry in 1971 when federal law made radio stations play a percentage of Canadian made music. Radio before that did not do that. They played whatever the hit parade was in New York or Los Angeles or... Right. So once that had changed, an industry got built here. But before that happened, a new artist emerged from word of mouth. Now we have the web, of course, and we have all these sites, and you can make the beginnings of an inroad on a career if you use social media well, yes. uh, if, uh, if you have a really good website. But it's hard, and it's, this is making it harder. That's right. But in the end, cream does come to the top, I think. It does. And we'll it have does. great artists will emerge and I don't know. And it's creating, an oppo- it's creating an opportunity for people to find different ways to tell their story, to use their voice, to cut through the noise, to make their point of difference. Because there are millions of social media sites out there for artists, millions of websites. How do you get someone to find you? How do you get someone to find your song on Spotify? Because when you're not performing live, you don't have that ability to reach that audience in the, in the hotel or the club and leverage up the marketing of that venue. So now is a time for us to pivot, innovate, get super creative and find what our point of difference is. And I think you have been instrumental in that for the careers of so many people um, throughout the ages. So... But my my question for you really is, Richard, have you finished your book? Oh, God. Actually, I was working on it yesterday and a little bit today. It's, um, I've wasted 10 weeks of this um, event not doing anything. Um, And now I'm starting to do something. Uh, I did a piece, uh, finally finished it on a singer that I had some involvement with in her early career called Arnie DeFranco. Um, I've done pieces for the book on uh, a number of Canadian artists, but also people like Ray Charles and Solomon Burke and a bunch of others that I've had some kind of involvement with. And their stories. The book is called Miles, The Night Miles Davis Tried to Buy My Car and 100 Other Mostly True Stories of Life at the Edge of Music. Ah. And I think any, anybody who does works in music for 50 years and doesn't have any stories, well, we blew it. <laughs> Big time. It's all about the story. Oh, it's just, and some of them are, are, are uh, funny and some of them are sad and some of them are in between. And some of them have, are um, not suitable for work. Um, there are some very, very silly stories. Well, I look when, forward to when, reading that book. I, I, can I ask when? What do you do with all this stuff? Are you are you editing it? Are you? How does it how does it work from here? How do you spread this? Well, we are uh, publishing these podcasts every day. We're not editing it. We're keeping it real and and raw. Okay. And we're talking to everyone around the world, whether they're at events, whether they're in hospitality, whether they're in music. I've got classical yeah. musicians, punk musicians. I've got everybody. Because, look, this experience is not exclusive. It's, um, it's affecting everyone and it is transforming the face of three industries all at once. So to me, that's yeah. a story that has to be told. And, you know, what we do moving forward 
I think we can leverage off each other's experiences and each other's perspectives of what our visions are collectively about what this is going to look like, you know, six months down the track, two years down the track, 10 years down the track. Because people like you, you've, you've been in this business for six decades. That's an incredible investment. And you've got this enormous asset of experience and knowledge. So that, that's one story that needs to be preserved and valued. And that's what the music reel is all about, is making sure we get those stories out there. Because these stories, if we look back on this in five years' time, I think it's going to be quite valuable to see how we've gone through this process a lot of artists have had some pretty severe mental health challenges. Like you said, a lot of businesses have closed their doors. And it's how we respond to this event and how we tell our own story. For me, that is almost, I think, that's the story in itself, all of us together with our story. So, um, yeah, I, that's why I, I really, agree. You hear me? Uh, yeah. I think... I, yes, I can, and I think for for many performers, especially those in uh, niche groups, so uh, be they um, folkies or blues or whatever, uh, which is normally the field that I've worked in. I I used to say, well, it, you could do pretty well, and then the record industry went to disappeared. And, you know, can somebody can get hundreds of thousands of streams and eventually get a check for $15. Yes. Um, so that part of the business seems to have kind of collapsed. And yeah. Whether it will change, whether streaming services will, instead of making billions of dollars in profits, will, will do less well and share that wealth. Then I used to say, but it's okay, live music will be fine. But I have to say that in the last two or three years, I've sort of changed that. Um, we all watch, especially now, we all watch Netflix. We all stay home. We uh, don't go out as much as we used to do. I'm an exception. Uh, and it's harder and harder. In, in urban centers, the little clubs that we used to go to are suddenly holes in the ground and 40-story condo buildings. Uh, we've, so there's a shortage of venues. There's a shortage of audiences. And how we solve that? Well, if... If you broke through, if you were a Canadian artist like Justin Bieber or Weekend or Drake, yeah, sure, um, you've got an audience. But for the next foreseeable future, you will not be playing in a stadium with 20,000 people. That's right. You will not be, and the folky blues people will not be at folk festivals or blues festivals. I don't know about Australia, but I suppose that most of your festivals are cancelled or postponed or yep, whatever. Yeah, all of them. Every one of them in Canada has gone, every one of them. Yeah. And in the folk area, however you define the F word, as I call it, uh, there are 29 summer folk festivals in this province alone. Every wow. one of them has gone. And the big ones in Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Winnipeg, all gone. And it's a gamble in a year or two years. I think people will return to them if they can survive financially. I mean, look, here's the deal. I'm older than dirt. So I don't really have to worry about this. I'm sad. My summer, this summer, was going to be six festivals, no, seven festivals in eight weeks, right across the country. And I was really looking forward to it. 
the festival organizers in Canada know me and I've, you know, I've, I've seemed to have a, a permanent backstage pass. <laughs> I have the best time. I meet the nicest people. It's like going to summer camp. And I can't do it. I can't even go to England and drink in a pub. Yeah. I can't go down the road and drink in a pub. Uh, strange times, love. They are strange times. And Richard, I just, I think it's been great to talk to you today because it's given artists around the world a different perspective about not just what it's like now, but what we've got facing us. And I think, um, super clever innovative thinkers creative thinkers which what which is what artists are they don't think the normal they think outside the box i think that they're going to come up with some different ways of of yeah making their space in this brave new world so all i can say to you my friend is finish that book you need to finish the book so we can actually read yep. it and read your stories and um look it's been great to talk to you i think we'll leave it there and um you look Congratulations. I popped your Zoom, Cherry. I'm very excited to know that I've done Thank that. Thank you very much. <laughs> and Richard, take care. It was so great to talk to you. And good luck with the rest of your Zoom calls. And I will stay in touch and with you. I, I'm, and I will se send you an, uh, a text with a not suitable for work or public broadcast joke that we, you will laugh at. That's so not like you. We never have those kind of <laughs> conversations. Bless you and thanks a lot. Thanks, I'm Richard. See you later. Take care.